As you've now seen, genetic engineering is an extraordinarily valuable tool that has immensely increased the possibilities of plant and animal breeding. Access to these tools has been and will continue to be especially important if we are able to address the persistent challenges we face with pests and abiotic challenges and the emergent challenges brought about by global climate change. With genetic engineering and with ever-emerging new breeding technologies, breeders have relatively few theoretical limits to what kinds of traits are achievable. Yet, the number of GMOs actually out in the field being produced by farmers and eaten by consumers are very few. Let's explore why there are so many interesting products in the pipeline that address real-world constraints, and yet why so few crops have made it to the market. To begin, consider this figure produced annually by the International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications, ISA. Biotech crops occupy nearly 180 million hectares globally. Those crops are grown by approximately 18 million farmers in at least 28 countries, with slightly more area being grown in developing countries than industrial ones. As of the end of 2015, crops with herbicide-tolerant traits occupied more than half of that area alone. Herbicide tolerance, insect resistance through Bt, and combinations of these two traits comprise nearly 100% of the biotech crops grown globally. By crop, GMO soybean accounts for 50% of the total global hectares of GMO crops. Maize accounts for 30%. Add in cotton, and you've accounted for 95% of all GMO crops. Add canola, and we're up to 99%. That's right, 99% of the GMOs grown are in only four crops, soybean, maize, cotton, and canola, all developed by the large multinational corporations that are often the target of criticism by anti-GMO advocacy movements. What's more, only two products in the hands of farmers were developed by public sector scientists, the GMO papaya developed at Cornell University and the University of Hawaii, and the BT brinjal developed by the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute which, along with a few other minor crops, contribute to the remaining 1%. Why are there not more GMOs on the market? If the tools of genetic engineering open up vast possibilities for plant and animal breeding, where are the products? Where is the diversity? To a great extent, it's stuck in the pipeline, far from farmers' fields. Caught in political and regulatory tangle, we have a range of exciting products that offer benefits to consumers and to the environment. There are crops with nutritional traits like provitamin A rice and banana, crops that improve the environment through reduced pesticide use like disease-resistant bananas, virus-resistant cassava, and others. There are crops that improve forest ecosystems like the blight-resistant American chestnut and fast-growing eucalyptus. And there are crops that are more resilient in the face of climate change like water-efficient maize, drought-resistant soybean, and crops that use nitrogen more efficiently these examples, and many, many more. The Cornell Alliance for Science recently compiled a database of these promising projects fueled by small businesses, the public sector, and public-private partnerships that are detailed in an accessible wiki-style database called Database of Emerging Agricultural Learning, or DEAL. You can go to this database and explore what is in the pipeline and add information that you're aware of in your own country or disciplinary contexts. Why are these hundreds of products not yet in the hands of farmers? We'll discuss the many reasons throughout this course. Sometimes the science itself comes up against a roadblock and scientific approaches and experiments need to be revised. But more often, the limits of the technology's impact come from outside of science. Regulatory approval in many countries can be a cumbersome and time-consuming process that becomes cost prohibitive for most small businesses and public sector enterprises. Many countries have yet to put into place their own biosafety and other legal frameworks. Politics brought to the fore by anti-GMO agenda groups and global trade issues can all influence whether a GMO makes it into the hands of their intended beneficiaries. Just recently emerged from the pipeline in the U.S. is a non-browning apple and a non-browning low-bruise potato that contains less acrylamide after frying. 
Even more remarkable was the approval of the first genetically engineered animal for human consumption, the Aqua Advantage salmon, a product that was stuck in regulatory limbo for 20 years. And this drove up the cost to the developers to an estimated $85 million. These three examples provide hope that more diverse traits in more food crops and animals may make their way to farmers and consumers soon. Ideally, these new traits will not only offer benefits to the farmers who produce them, but the consumers whose purchasing power will encourage future innovation. The next generation of GMOs should also continue to have a positive impact on the environment so that we can produce more food for more people using fewer natural resources and so that agriculture can have a much lighter footprint on the environment.